In this lesson, we're going to introduce two additional analytical methods to find limits using a substitution technique and a simplification technique. So we'll tackle each of those in turn for substitution and then simplification. Last time, we introduced a couple of basic limit formulas or principles, formulas for constant functions and the identity function and their limits. And then we introduced formulas for arithmetic combinations of functions. And those allowed us to find limits analytically instead of having to rely on graphs or tedious numerical calculations. And then we looked at an example in which we use those formulas to find a limit of a polynomial function. And what we did there can be extended to find any limit of any polynomial function. We're going to look at a way now to do this even more quickly and efficiently using a substitution method. We'll also introduce an additional method involving simplification that will sometimes work when substitution does not work right away. So let's begin by looking at this substitution method for limits. If you go back to our example from last time in which we found a limit of a polynomial function, the exact example we used involved finding the limit as x approaches 3 of x squared plus 2x plus 5. And we saw using the constant rule, the identity rule, and our arithmetic combination rules for limits that that limit was equal to 20. But you might also have already noticed that the value of that function when x equals 3 is 20. Plug 3 in for x, calculate the function value, you'll get 20. And so at least in this case, we could have correctly found the limit, at least we would have obtained the right result, by just substituting 3 into the function and basically evaluating the function at 3. Now, that might have just been an accident, but it's not. In fact, that will work quite often, this kind of substitution into a function. It doesn't always work for limits, but when it does, it's usually the quickest way to find the value of a limit. And the good news is this substitution method works for most of the functions that you're familiar with and that we will need to use in calculus. It'll work for polynomial functions. It'll work for most rational functions. It'll work for exponential functions, logarithmic functions, and at least some trigonometric functions. The one big requirement here is that when you do the substitution to find the limit, you need to come up with a defined expression. If what you get is undefined, you can't draw any conclusions about the limit. You can also use substitution when dealing with arithmetic combinations of these kinds of functions. So substitution is a really versatile and simple technique for finding limits. Here too, of course, the requirement that the expression you get be defined is in place. Here's an example. Let's say we want the limit as x approaches zero of this fairly complicated looking function right here, e to the power x plus 4x over the cosine of x minus 2x squared. Now that's a complicated function expression, but notice that it's an arithmetic combination of a bunch of familiar functions. In the numerator, we have e to the power x, an exponential function, plus 4x. So that's just a combination of an exponent, a sum of an exponential function and a linear polynomial function. And in the denominator, we have the cosine of x and 2x squared, and we're making the difference of those. We're then taking both of those and making the quotient function of them. So we just have an arithmetic combination of familiar functions here. And each of those simpler functions that make this up have limits that can be found by substitution. So what we can do to find this limit is to substitute zero for x. And as long as what we get does not come out undefined, as long as we don't get zero in a denominator or something like that, that will be the value of the limit. So let's do the work. There's what we get when we do our substitution. And each of those expressions is relatively easy to evaluate. e to the power zero is one, 
four times zero is zero, the cosine of zero is one, and two times zero squared is zero. So that whole thing works out to one. And we didn't end up with anything undefined here, so we can conclude that the value of that limit is equal to one as well. That's all it took. We can quickly confirm this by using a graph. So this is what we just found using substitution, that that limit is equal to one. Here's a graph of that function, the graph of y equals e to the power x plus four x over cosine of x minus two x squared. And you can see from the graph, the point zero one is there, right? We found, that's what we found when we did our substitution in effect. But notice as well that as we move closer and closer to where x equals zero, we find that our y coordinates are getting closer and closer to one. And so that confirms that the limit we found is correct. Let's turn to the simplification method now, which is a little more complicated, although still not too difficult to use, but it can be used in the cases where substitution doesn't work. So like I said, substitution will not always work. In particular, it will not work when the result of the substitution is an undefined expression. So here's an example. Let's say we want to find the limit as x approaches one of x squared minus one over x minus one. Well, you can try substitution. If you do, you'll get that right there. And if you do the arithmetic, that it turns into zero over zero, which is undefined because it has zero in the denominator. Let's take a look at that limit graphically. So the function we're interested in is y, the one defined by y equals x, x squared minus one over x minus one. And we wanna find the limit as x approaches one. Well, there's the graph of our function. And notice here, one, two is there, it's not on the graph. Right? Our function is undefined when x equals one. But as we get closer and closer to where x equals one, we find that our function values, our y coordinates are getting closer and closer to where y equals two. So from the graph, we can kind of predict or expect that our limit value is two. The question is, how could we figure that out without using a graph? Substitution didn't work. So what else could we do? Well, here we're going to rely on a kind of simplification principle for limits. Here's the kind of statement of the principle. It says that if two expressions are algebraically equivalent to each other, then the functions that they define have the same domain sorry, the same limits, even though the domains of the functions might be different. So in other words, if we have a function expression and we can transform it algebraically into a different function expression using nothing but algebraic equivalence principles, then we can use the simpler or at least the other expression to find the limit we want. So let's see how to do that with our example. Our goal is to find this limit here analytically, the limit as x approaches one of x squared minus one over x minus one. Now, in this case, we can simplify our function expression by factoring and then canceling. There's the factorization in the numerator and notice there's a common factor of x minus one that we can cancel. So the whole thing simplifies to good old x plus one. So by our simplification principle, these two limits are equal. The expressions that define the two functions are algebraically equivalent. So any limits involving one, or any limit involving one of the functions will be the same as the limit involving the other, as long as X is approaching the same number. That second limit, the limit as X approaches one of X plus one can be found by substitution. Plug one in for X, you'll get two. So that's the value of the first limit as well. And we already saw from the graph that that is what we would expect. Here's another example involving simplification. We'll find this time the limit as X approaches negative three of X squared plus X minus six over X plus three. So here's the solution 
to this problem. There's the limit we're trying to find. I'm going to simplify that function expression. And again, I'll do that by factoring. Here I'm factoring the numerator. Factors into x plus 3 times x minus 2. That gives us a common factor of x plus 3 that we can cancel. And we're left with just x minus 2. And these are all equal to each other. The limits are all equal because of that simplification principle. And this last limit that you see right there can be found by substitution. Plug negative 3 in for x, you won't get an undefined expression. So that ends up being negative 5. And that's the value of the limit that we started with as well. Just to confirm this graphically, there is a graph of this function, y equals x squared plus x minus 6 over x plus 3. And you can see from the graph that even though negative 3, negative 5 is not on the graph, again, this function is undefined when x equals negative 3, as we move closer to where x equals negative 3, our y coordinates are getting closer to negative 5. By the way, and we'll talk more about this vocabulary later, but we say in this case that there's a hole in the graph at negative three, negative five. The function is undefined again at negative three, where x equals negative three. But this is what our simplification tells us. Everywhere else along the graph, except at that one point, negative three, negative five, the graph that we see here is just like the graph of y equals x minus two. That's why the one expression can be simplified into the other one. And when we're finding the limit as x approaches negative three, we don't care what's happening at the point where x equals negative three. We wanna know what's happening near where x equals negative three. And that's gonna be the same as what's happening near where x equals negative three on the graph of y equals x minus two. That's why the two limits are equal to each other. It can happen that both substitution and simplification fail. So in some cases, you can't use either of these to find the limit. Here's an example. Say you wanna find the limit as x approaches zero of the sine of x over x. Well, if you try substitution, you'll get zero over zero. So that doesn't work. If you get zero over zero or any undefined expression, you can't draw any conclusions about the limit. There's also no clear way to simplify here. I don't know of any way to say factor the sine of X in some way that would allow you to cancel the factor of X in the denominator or anything like that. But we, sh we shouldn't and can't conclude from the fact that these two analytical methods failed that the limit does not exist. The best thing to do in this case is to use the graph of the function that will be a good indication of whether the limit exists and if so, what it is. So we'll find this limit graphically. That's what we want to find. The limit as x approaches zero of the sine of x over x. Here's the graph of our function. You can see that there's another one of these holes at the point zero, one. And setting that aside, as we move closer to where x equals zero, which is what we'll do to find the limit, we see that our y coordinates are getting closer and closer to one. Therefore, the value of this limit is one. And we can conclude that from the graph, even though none of our analytical methods allow us to find the limit. 